All right, welcome to Morro Bay. So hopefully you've watched the, the video about the history of fishing in Morro Bay. Now I'm gonna be talking about some of the different types of fishing. We'll be walking down and checking out some of these boats down here in a little bit and discussing the different types of fishing that's done in the Morro Bay area. But first I'd like to start off with a brief discussion about the, the general types of permit, open access, individual transferable quota, and different types of fishing associated with those, those quotas. So first of all, we have a general type of fishing that we call open access. So open access is a type of fishing that's done where you have to get a permit for your boat and for yourself. Your deckhand also has to have a permit and then you're able to go out and fish for certain species of fish with quotas on some, but other ones are actually just totally open. Uh, some examples of this are local fishing for albacore tuna, for white sea bass and halibut. These species don't have any monthly quotas and if the fishing is good for those species, you can go out with that open access permit and catch as many of those organisms as you want. Other fish that would be within this open access are offshore fish such as uh, sable fish and some are deep water rock fishes. There are limited amounts of quota available for those. Some have bi-weekly quotas, some have monthly quotas, but you're allow allowed a limited amount of those types of fish. In general, open access types of fisheries uh, were the types, types that were done in the past. Uh, most of our fisheries historically were just open access. You just have to be a commercial fisher, you can go out and fish for whatever species that you wanted. But what we found over the years is that while this sounds like a great idea, I mean, these resources that we have out in the ocean, they're all of our resources and we should all be able to access them. But unfortunately, what this leads to is overfishing. As people go out and catch fish and they're making money off of it, somebody else will see they're making money off of it and they're gonna to wanna to fish for that species too. So generally speaking, when we have open access types of fisheries over time, it usually leads to overfishing because there's no limit on the amount of fish that are being caught and as more and more people get involved in the fishery, it's just, it just can lead to no other way than to overfishing. Sounds like a great idea. If we could just restrict ourselves and, and, and limit the amount of fish that we catch, it would be a great way to harvest our ocean resources. But unfortunately, we're not able to do that. And, and generally speaking around the world, if you look at the history of commercial fisheries, that just leads to overfishing. The other type of fisheries that we have, and this is growing more and more every year is what we call ITQ fisheries or individual transferable quotas. There's a lot of different names for this. Some people call them cat shares, but these are all ways that we can go out and capture fish in the ocean, but just do it in a more controlled manner. They're called transferable quotas because they're a permit that you get that you then own. Now these permits can then be sold on the open market and unfortunately what this can lead to is really high prices for some of these permits. Many of these permits cost many thousands of dollars, some even cost as much as a million dollars. I believe our local spot prawn permits, which is a very limited commercial fishery off our coast that uses traps to catch our spot prawns, is about a million dollars for one of these permits. Uh, many of the other permits cost anywhere from 50 to 100,000 to maybe even $200,000. So once again, this is, a, this is a good system for being able to regulate fisheries. You ha now have ownership in the fishery by the individual commercial fishers that are involved. They have a set amount of quota that they're allowed to catch. It's either set up weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly, and they're not allowed to go over that amount of catch. So it really gets ownership in the resource. It limits the amount of bycatch. It prevents what we call race to fish, which is the idea of going out there and trying to catch as many fish as you can before your fellow fishers can catch them. And it really reduces the, the pressure on the stocks in the long term. Now anglers are able to go out when they want. They can go out when the weather is good. They can go out when the market is good and they can spread the catch out over a longer period of time, hopefully being able to raise the value of that catch when they bring it in. So a lot of fisheries have shifted to these transferable quotas because of the fact that they're able to regulate them a little bit easier and they're supposed to hopefully over time lead to a lot less overfishing, less bycatch and increased value of the fishery. All right, we'll walk down here a little bit, talk about ITQs a little bit more. So one of the problems with ITQs is the fact that 
the way that a lot of these folks got their initial permit was that they were already in the fishery. And, and a lot of fisheries, what they did, they, they looked at what the landings were for a commercial fisher for the last three or so years. They would take an average of that and they would, they would give them that as their amount to fish or their amount of their quota. And so what it did basically is it gave people that were involved in these fisheries a lot of money. And so if you were in this fishery and you've received several quotas for a species that you've been fishing for for years, in a lot of cases, you were given literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of permits, which, which is great for them, but what if you're new? What if you're young? What if you're just trying to get involved in a fishery and you don't have 100,000 or $200,000 to be able to invest to get involved in a fishery? So it's, it's a great idea and it works for the most part, but there's also a big risk of people being able to monopolize a resource. Uh, if you have really rich people out there, they could come along literally and, and buy up all the permits. And you could have people that aren't even fishing and they could be, be wealthy folks come along and buy up a lot of those permits and then basically reissue that quota to folks to fish for them. And so it kind of makes, makes fishers sometimes sharecroppers in a sense. And the fact that they don't, they don't own their permits, they might not even own the boat and they're just going out and fishing for somebody else and making a wage. Now, generally speaking, folks that, that work on commercial fishing boats, if you're not the captain, you get, a, you get a percentage of the catch that comes in. And these sharecropper types of systems work the same, type, same way, where a captain working for another boat owner still gets a percentage of the amount of fish that's brought in and sold. Once again, it's, it's a good system, but you can see that uh, it kind of gets away from the whole idea of being a commercial fisher and being able to access those resources. All right, let's walk down onto the dock here and see the different types of boats that we have and the different types of species that they're fishing for. Normally on a nice weather day like we're having today, we would see a lot of these boats would be gone. But unfortunately, because of the fact of the virus, there's not a lot of market for these folks. And so unfortunately, they don't have a lot of play places to sell their fish. So we're seeing a lot of these boats just sitting idle in the, in the harbor here because they don't have a market for their, for their species to sell. All right, walking over here, this is a, a commercial boat. As you can see by the permit on the side of the boat, you can see that they have a commercial salmon permit. These are a, uh, an open access fishery in a sense that, that anybody can get one of these, uh, get one of these permits, but there are limited, limited amounts of these permits. And they do sell on the open market. Uh, currently, because salmon fishing is, is pretty good, you can probably get a permit for maybe 20 or $30,000. A few years ago when the fishing was shut down, you might've been able to get one for, for five or $10,000. So the commercial salmon fishing permit allows the angler to go out and catch salmon. There is no quota on salmon. Uh, these folks are going out and trolling for them and they're allowed to catch as, as many as they want in a day. But if folks have ever been out salmon fishing, you know that salmon fishing is very difficult. Uh, salmon trolling is generally a, an unproductive way to catch fish in the ocean. You're basically trolling lines through the water and you're hoping that a fish comes along and bites your lure or your bait. So we have these really heavy lead weights. Uh, these weights can weigh as much as 20, 30, even 40 pounds. And these are attached to heavy lines that come around these wheels right here. So these, these heavy stainless steel lines loop around through the wheels. These are hydraulic systems. They attach to the lead balls. The lead balls drop deep down into the water uh, salmon are pelagic fish. They can be anywhere from the bottom of the ocean all the way to the surface. Generally uh, inside maybe 500 feet or so. And so the anglers don't know exactly where the salmon are located. So generally what they do is they space the lures along the length of the line as they drop it down on the water. Uh, a lot of times they're doing about every two fathoms which is about 12 feet. One fathom is equal to about six feet or so. And so they put a lure every, every two fathoms. Uh, sometimes they use bait and, it's, and they drop it down until it gets close to the bottom if they think the fish are at the bottom of the water. 
and then they they lower out these booms these big arms that go way up into the air these are called outriggers and when they get out into the ocean these things are going to flop out to the side so what this really does is it allows the boat to fish a really large part of the water column if they were just fishing straight down to the side of the boat they'd be covering a less a smaller portion of the ocean but by dropping out those outrigger arms they're going to be covering a much larger percentage of the water as they troll through and having a lure spaced out every two fathoms allows, allows them to cover every part of the water column now as they're trolling through the water they're looking at their their depth sounder or their fish finder or their sonar whatever you want to call it and they're looking for for schools of bait if you find the bait generally speaking you're going to find the salmon and some some anglers actually have depth sounders that are, are accurate enough to be able to see the fish in the water which would be fantastic because then you know you're actually fishing for them at that time and they wait for the fish to bite now salmon are are an interesting fish if you ever fish for them you know that they they don't always want to bite and you could literally see them on your depth sounder know that they're there and be fishing for hours and hours and not catch a single fish and then suddenly something changes and all of a sudden they start biting and you can catch quite a few fish in a short amount of time now while they don't have quotas on salmon it's it's a really good day around here if somebody catches oh maybe 20 to, to 40 fish a day. Uh, last year there was some really good fishing and there were some days where boats are bringing in 100 fish a day, but, but that's pretty rare. Uh, the salmon along our coast are, are averaging between about eight and 10 pounds. Uh, 20 pounds is a really large salmon, but the average size is, is right about that, that probably 10 pound size or so. So if you have a day where you're bringing in 100 fish and they're averaging 10 pounds a piece and you're making $8 or more a pound during the beginning of the season, uh, you're having a really good day. You're talking, you know, eight to $10,000 day you just had out salmon fishing. Now there's a couple of restrictions on salmon that make it a very sustainable type of fishery. And one of those is that you have to use barbless hooks. So the hooks that you have to use for salmon don't have a barb on them. And therefore when you bring them up to the boat, if it's not the right species, then you have to let it go. Or if it's too small, you have to let it go. So the minimum size range for salmon in the state of California is 24 inches for sport and 26 inches for commercial. So if you catch a fish that's less than 26 inches, you have to let it go. And having that barbless hook on there makes it much easier to let go. Uh, sometimes we do catch coho salmon in California and you're not allowed to keep those either. So the commercial fishers are, are very well educated about what they can keep, the size and the species. And the fish comes up to the side of the boat. They look down, they can tell very quickly if it's a Chinook salmon or a coho salmon, they know instantly if it's 26 inches or above. If it's coho or less than 26 inches, they have a long little, little hook on a rod that slips down. You grab the hook, you just pull it backwards, and it falls right out of the fish's mouth. So it makes salmon, salmon fishing a very sustainable way of capturing fish. You, you aren't fishing very effectively, so you really, really can't overfish with this method. You also don't get much bycatch. If you did, the bycatch is still alive and you could leave it uh, back in the water and, and it does just fine. Uh, they estimate that most of these fish have, have more than 90% chance of survival uh, that are caught and released in these fisheries. So very sustainable type of fishing when you catch fish via trolling. All right, let's see what else we got here. Here's another salmon fishing boat over here. One of the boats that's usually moored right over here that I wanted to talk about, and I and he's almost always here, but but this is squid season, and there's a boat that's that's usually moored right over here, and this boat is a light boat, and all of this boat does is it goes out in the ocean, and it has a really really good sonar or fish finder, and it looks for schools of squid. Now during the new and full moon, uh, generally starting in spring and summer, but sometimes throughout the year, the squid will come into shallow water to spawn. And these are, these are small squid. These are what we call the market squid or the opalescent squid. And they come into shallow water to spawn. They mate in shallow water and they attach their eggs down on the bottom of the ocean. And these light boats go out and they look for these huge aggregations of squid. Uh, these squid schools can be huge. They can be literally tens of thousands of tons. And they go out there and they, they light up the water at nighttime. And when they do this, the squid are attracted up towards the surface of the water. Once they get the squid up towards the surface of the water, 
they call in their buddy who owns a purse seine boat. And so a purse seine boat, generally there aren't any here in Morro Bay, they're usually in other ports. And they will, they're a large boat, generally with a smaller boat kind of on the back of it. it looks like it's kind of riding up on a backpack. And these purse seine boats go out to that large school of squid that's been attracted to that light boat. And it's, it's a long net that the smaller boat now takes around. And, and you've probably seen examples of this in some of my other lectures. And it literally takes it around the school of squid and then they close the bottom of the net like the purse on a strings on a purse and then they they bring that net in uh, this is a very effective way at catching squid literally a boat in a single night of fishing can catch 80 to 100 tons of squid now squid don't get a really high dollar per pound but if you're catching tens of thousands of pounds you can imagine that you're having a pretty good night of fishing so the guy that owns this boat is Dave Rose. Um, it's, it's usually right here. And, uh, and all he does is light up the squid. Um, he has these really bright lights that, that hang over the side. And if you ever see these boats at nighttime, it literally looks like the sun is coming up. Very, very, very bright. And the squid are attracted under that. And then the person sets his net around his boat and captures all the squid that have been attracted up to the lights. Now, he makes anywhere from you know, 10 to 15% to of, of what the big boat catches. But he doesn't have to do any work other than the fact that he's going out and finding the squid and then turning on his lights and tracking the squid to the surface. So his, his work is, is pretty minimal. And he can make a pretty good amount of money in that type of fishery. Now, generally speaking, this is a very, very productive type of a fishery. Uh, there's over a billion dollars a year that are brought in in the California squid fishery annually. This is a, a good money maker for those folks. And it's generally a pr very sustainable way of catching these squid. Uh, the squid are fast growing species. Uh, generally their life cycle is about two to three years. And they reproduce, they reproduce very abundantly. And, and they're very sustainable because when we catch them, we generally aren't catching anything else. And the fishery is also closely regulated in the fact that, that we're not allowing it to overfish. Uh, so squid fishing is generally a very sustainable type of fishery. All right, let's, uh, let's continue down over here and see what other types of boats that we can see. So as I mentioned, there's another salmon fishing boat there. Uh, this other boat here looks like it's a, a long liner. The Persistence. Looks like a long line boat. I don't see any hooks on this. But basically what these are are large buoys. They would have an anchor on one side and drop the line over the side of the boat. And then there would be a very long line, obviously long lining, that's attached to that. There would be many hundreds of hooks attached to that line and each one of those hooks is gonna have some bait on it. Either a salted anchovy, piece of squid or something like that. They drop that down to the bottom, at least around here, they're doing bottom long lining. There are other fisheries around the world that do surface long lining for tuna, swordfish and mahi-mahi and things like that. But around here, they're, they're primarily fishing them on the bottom. So they're going for bottom dwelling species of fish, things like, like sable fish or black cod, rockfish, lean cod, cabazon, and organisms like that. So the, the, the long lining around here is once again, a very sustainable way to fish. This is the one, a type, one of the types of fisheries that they've moved to uh, from going the trawl method to the long line. You capture similar species that you did with the, the trawling over the hard rocky bottoms, and it's much less impactful on the environment because it's not damaging the habitat and you get a lot less bycatch. So the bycatch is generally pretty low with the long lining. Uh, with some of the long line species that you get as bycatch, you actually can let them go alive. So anytime we talk about a fishery and being able to release the bycatch alive, that makes it a very sustainable type of fishery. And so long line is generally considered a very sustainable type of a fishery locally because they're targeting certain species of fish. They're not damaging the habitat in any way as they set and retrieve their gear. And they're, they're catching a lot of fish, but they're not catching nearly as much as they used to catch with the trawling. The trawl boats used to go out and capture 20 to 30,000 pounds of seafood in a given trip. These boats are going out 
and they're catching maybe two to three thousand maybe four thousand pounds of seafood so while it's effective you're generally not going to be overfishing with this method and with the low bycatch rates um, you're, you're not having very big of an impact on the environment in addition to that because you're bringing fish in literally one by one you can take really good care of the fish this is a large fish tote that this guy has and here there's this big orange tote back here uh, that would be full of ice he would also have ice down on the lower part of his hole there and they would they would fill it up with ice before the trip and then as they catch the fish individually they would take care of them now what that means a lot of time is they're catching them one at a time they bring the fish in they will they'll sometimes cut the gills to bleed the fish out throw them in the ice slurry and then pack them in ice until they get back so the fish is is very very good quality there's a few anglers around here that actually do live rock fishing with this or live fish and some of these species especially if they don't have a swim bladder you can bring up from deep down in the ocean and you can you can keep them alive and when you do that the value in the in the markets goes way way up so long lining is a very sustainable way of capturing seafood okay i'm daryl terra and i'm uh captain of this boat the gustav and um i fish for albacore tuna salmon live fish and dungeness crab on here and for right now we're kind of shut down because of the virus. Uh, there's no market right now, no restaurants to buy fish. So we're kind of in a time to do boat work right now. And any questions for me? So as far as uh, crab, you have to have an individual permit for the crab fishing? Right, individual. It goes with the, uh, the boat instead of the individual for Dungeness. And then the uh, rock crab permit, that's the individual for the red rock crab or any rock crab species and salmon's also uh, the permit goes with the boat rather than the individual and the, the near shore and deeper near shore uh, trap and near shore trap endorsement are all individual permits and quite expensive so by the time you pay all those permits for your licenses it's about Twenty-seven, twenty-eight hundred dollars a year, and if and the Dungeness is biannual for the trap program, it ends up you're paying about thirty-five hundred dollars a year for your permits, almost thirty-seven, something like that. So, uh, not too many people have to pay that kind of money to go to work. True, and that and doesn't include the cost of the permit itself. No, but if you want to, uh, like, if you have an been participating in a fishery and you want to get into that fishery you have to buy the permit from another fisherman which can be quite expensive um, the near shore permits right now uh, with a, for the trap endorsement are going for about a hundred thousand dollars and that could be all subject to changes with you know what's going on in the uh, country here now things could change uh, and the Dungeness has gone down quite a bit too because of the, uh, the whale entanglement problem. Uh, they were worth about 120000 for a boat like mine and uh, now they've got dropped down to about half of that because our seasons have been cut way down because of that. Um, so we're all trying to work with the environmental community and find a solution to uh, keep that from happening, maybe in a buyout program or to get less traps out there or something like that. And um, I go for albacore, which I, they haven't been here for quite a while since about the last decent runs we've had around 2000. And, you know, it was pretty good out here. Some of my friends had big tuna boats. They had with a crew of, uh, you know, six, seven, eight guys in the rack. They got 25, 35, 10 days outside, the, um, out by the San Lucia bank there. And, but that was kind of the last of it. So I've been going up to Oregon and Washington uh, the last six years with this boat. And do you troll mostly or do you do troll the jack pole? I have a bait tank and a jack pole. You do jack pole? Yeah. Uh, I've actually developed a machine here that chums out the live anchovies, which really helps because I fish by myself and uh, works real good. When they want to bite, when they're on a ball of bait foaming and crashing, they uh, uh, that's when they want to go. Like last year, they weren't 
we didn't really have anchovy balls out there and so we were fishing mostly krill balls the fish so they weren't really working the surface and they weren't really frenzy and like that but still if you get a school they come up and they bite pretty good I had one day I had 400 there by myself so that was pretty good wow and how much can your boat hold uh, well I have two ice stoves to go here and these three wells are refrigerated and I use RSW mostly for those that stands for refrigerated seawater. And then the, uh, the two corner wells, those are whole fish. Those are about good for like 700 pounds. And the totes about the same thing. So that's about three and three quarter tons, short tons. And if I get, do real good and the weather's good, I can put fish in the bait tank. I've got it rigged so I can spray the refrigerated seawater on the fish that are in the bait tank and it cycles back down to that center hatch. And that would give me about four and a half tons. But real heavy, so it's got to be really good weather when it <laughs> Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So just doing boat work right now. And uh, right now, uh, the salmon, there should be a lot of salmon around. It's a really good run here last year. But, uh, of course, that's a fresh product, uh, the king salmon we catch here. And it's with all the restaurants being open, that's really a slim market there. And they just shut down the... Uh, um, dock sales up in Half Moon, which is really big. Half Moon Bay, they have a really big public uh, sales off the boats to the public, and they had to cut it down to reduce the public contact because mm -hmm. of the virus. Far. And then also the, um, so, you know, I don't know how that would go here if, if during salmon season. Anyway, uh, so the uh, healthy stocks, you know, the salmon did really good last year. Some guys did really well. But, you know, it's just a cycle. Every Some years are good, some years are bad. And same with the tuna. Now, down in the South Pacific, the albacore uh, had been pretty lousy for about, geez, probably close to 20 years. And then this year, it really came back good. The guys down there all had like over 100 tons of trolling, big jig boats. They have to be big because the weather's so bad down there. They're like fishing straight south of New Zealand about a thousand miles Wow! and there's nowhere to go you hmm. know it's like you're out in the middle of the ocean and the closest point of land would be New Zealand or Tahiti hmm. or, and then the guys go up to Samoa to unload sometimes or they just take it to these are bigger boats that can carry the load they used to uh, a lot of them would just take it up to Canada but there should be a good demand for albacore since it's canned fish um, hmm. since people are really buying a lot of that as they um, quarantine themselves it can it last in the cans for years and years you don't have to worry about it and um, it's a good healthy source of protein and our albacore here on this coast we don't catch the big longline fish uh, the longline fish are generally from 80 to 120 pounds they get really big and they stay down deep they quit come in the surface and just feed on squids so they really don't have much flavor as like our fish have uh, or surface feeding and they're feeding on anchovies, squid, and all kinds of other critters. And they, especially when they start feeding on the anchovies, they get a really high oil content and they have really good flavor. And since they are not, these bigger ones, our fish range from like 12 to 40 pounds and a lot of like 15, 16, 20 pounds. So you really, it's a low mercury content fish too also. So it's just really help, a lot better for you. And, um, that's about it. Any other questions there, Steve? So you, you said you also fish for salmon, so you have to totally retrofit your boat to be able to fish salmon? No, 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 really. Not too much? Okay. The jig poles and I put the hay rack on and it's pretty quick. Okay, yeah. okay. And you have, have the girdies that attach onto the side right. and yeah. your hydraulic systems. Right. Okay. Yep. So you'll be doing that probably in the next week or two? Uh, no, i got to see because of the way the marketing, I don't want to oh, okay. change over for just sit there and you can't see. No, no sales, right? Yeah, because there's oh. a lot of fish, there's a lot of salmon around. Uh, a lot of bait out there right now. It's all winter long when I was crabbing. You can see a lot of um, bait on the surface. At night it'd be breezing on the top and uh, hmm. looks really good for it. But if you don't have a market, that's the way it goes. How was the crabbing season? I heard it was not a very good crabbing uh, season this year. It was lousy here. The guys up north did pretty fair. I mean, if you're in the right place up north, but um, it was really pathetic here. Uh, yeah. That's but that's bad. fishing. Yeah. Yeah. It's called fishing, not catching. <laughs> Certainly. All right. Hey, I appreciate your time. Sure. All right. Good luck. All right. Look, we have some uh, fish traps over here. We'll talk about fish traps as another method of being able to capture seafood. So this is a fish trap. Um, traps are used for all sorts of organisms. We can capture fish in these. We can capture lobsters, crab, 
Uh, some traps are modified to capture shrimp. Um, there's a local fisher he, here that even does it for this fish called a hagfish. And so the traps allow the organism to, to swim in. So this area up here would have some bait in it. So they lift this up and you'd put some, some dead fish in there, some dead squid or something like that. Uh, some, some fishers get pretty, uh, pretty inventive with, with secret concoctions of smells and whatnot that perhaps a, a maybe attract a certain species they think just, just helps bring the fish into the pots. So the fish would, uh, would come in, push open this little door right here and crawl into the pot. So this, this door right here, all right, we just put you right into this thing. All right, here are your fish. You're going in, you push the door open. Hey, and you're caught inside of the pot. And now with the door closed, you're not able to get back out of the pot. So it traps you in the pot. Um, not, not all of the pots are gonna have those doors on them, but a lot of them do, just cause they don't want any, any captured fish to get out of the pot. So this method is, is a very sustainable way of capturing seafood because you're, you're catching a small volume of, of organisms generally. You're not gonna overfish with this method. Um, the fish or invertebrates that you're getting, the crabs and whatnot, they're alive when you bring them up. Uh, when you talk about crab fishing, it's a, it makes it very sustainable because for Dungeness crab locally, you're only allowed to keep the males. You have to leave the females in the water. So if you get a female in your trap, you just throw it back in. They're alive and doing just fine. And so it makes it a very sustainable way of capturing not only crab, but any type of fish because you bring the fish in alive. If you happen to get bycatch, you can let that fish go and it's gonna be doing just fine. One of the things that can happen with this is you could lose your pot. And if that happens, you could continue to catch fish while your pot's out there and you don't know where it's at. Maybe a storm came along and, and drifted it away where you can't find it. So they call those ghost pots and ghost pots can be a, a, a big impact sometimes. Generally speaking, they will go out and try and find those because they have a value associated with them, but, but sometimes they're lost so far away that nobody will ever find them. Another thing that can happen with these pots is that there has to be a, a buoy that floats this pot up towards the surface. So if we have literally hundreds of pots set out in the ocean, there could be lots of buoy lines out there and that could lead to entanglement with whales. And that is becoming a, a, a bigger problem, at least, at least folks are acknowledging it's a bigger problem. So they're working hard to try and come up with ways to reduce the number of buoy lines out in the ocean. So fewer, the fewer buoys that you have out there, the less chance that you have of a whale or marine mammal becoming entangled in that. So one of the options for that is, is you could have your pot set in a string. So instead of, if you have 10 pots, let's say, instead of having a buoy for each individual pot, let's say you have your pots connected to each other. So maybe you just have 50 meters of line connecting one pot to the next, and then you just have one buoy for 10 pots instead of 10 buoys for 10 pots. And so that'd be a good way of reducing the impact of the whale entanglement. So generally speaking, we talk about pots, very, very sustainable way of capturing seafood. We'll keep these protected. All right, coming over this way, we talked to this fellow before. He's the one that fishes for albacore tuna up off the coast of Oregon. But like a lot of these guys, he, he fishes for all sorts of fish. Um, many of these folks, you, you can't just fish for one species. You have to diversify. You have to fish for lots of different organisms to be able to, to make a good profit at this. Hi, hey, Roger. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing virtual labs. Wow. Did you bring any kind of a container? I did not bring a container. Why? What do you got? I went out with my A permit, got the few rock cod that I could possibly catch. Oh, okay. People on to, and you're welcome to some if you like. Okay, uh, yeah, I might be, I might have something in my car. That'd be cool. You'd be wise to get it. All right. Hey, uh, would you mind doing a little interview with my class here? Well, no, I did not at all. Okay. I'll walk around and we can chat oh, for a few. Way, yeah. Okay, well, I could, I can socially distance you from this side, well, maybe. We're not worried about that. My <laughs> wife and I have been in the uh, house for I think it's. She's been there 35 days, oh. and I, I come down here, but that's about all we do. <laughs> so it's a strange time. It's a very strange time. But um, and, and, and try to grab some sanity in between. Uh, Monday morning, I went out to catch some rockfish, targeting vermilion and yellows. It's about near shores closed, so you, we couldn't catch blues or what we did catch. We released, we popped and released. We were responsible. 
Every blue that came up, we took the time to pop it with a needle and send it back down. Great. And uh, so we didn't go out there. I, one thing I won't do is go through and cull fish and just and, and then just throw them back and let them float. I, I you know, I, I've always been a proponent of a good resource, so that's kind of contradictory to what what we do and what we believe. So we did just that. Went out to a couple of spots there that were up off of San Simeon and had a few strings of straight reds. Cool. And caught caught what we thought our neighbors and people could enjoy. That no one no one's had any fresh fish for now for a while. Right. And uh, fresh rock cod's way better than anything that's ever frozen. So that's what we did. And um, had a lot of fun doing it. Went into the campsite at at San Simeon. Camped at San Simeon. And uh, in the boat. In the boat. Nice. Not very proud to say, but me and my buddy almost finished a fifth of vodka <laughs> by an orange juice. And we had a blast. And it was like this this sanity finally from, you know, being stuck at home so long, you know, and, and, and being cooped up. So uh, being out on the ocean, it was a beautiful day. The, the fish were biting the first day really good. And we're using this setup here on the side? Right here, the snapper reel with these, uh, I got it right here, with these, uh, these are the gangs that we make. Okay. They're made out of, uh, they're made out of a material that we used to get. I got a ton of it there from uh, SNL. And the little 10 out J hooks and, and, and gangs, and anyway, real effective for reds. That and little piece of squid and, and other fish. So we went out and did that and just had a ball. I called my wife. I said, "This is where I belong." <laughs> so, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it, I just had to get out. I mean, it's been, been a month since we fired up the boat. Yeah, looks like things are going to start to kind of maybe improve here shortly. Uh, Mark is starting to talk about opening up. Okay, uh, we've done a great job here in San Luis County containing this thing. Yes, uh, I looked at the Paso Robles news today. The count was the same. And out of 120 people, uh, I think it was 101 had already recovered. So there's 19 sick. That's pretty good when you consider yes. the whole county. So we're, we're doing well yes. here there, and, and uh, we're doing our part as well. But we uh, we wanted to give our friends some fresh fish, and that's what we did. We that's went awesome. out and had a good time, <laughs> and real good time, and uh, did what we do best. Yeah. So uh, this uh, weekend, my boy's coming down, I'm gonna put the hay rack on for salmon. Oh, good. And uh, gear up for that. And uh, right now everything else is kind of on hold. I did have a black hot order last week, but oh. uh, I just, uh, I don't know if I just, I had this plan and I just didn't wanna, just didn't wanna go offshore just yet, you know, and have, you know, so we did this and had a great time. Cool. It's good to see you again. All right, good to see you too. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Say hello. Uh, but they're uh, they're uh, what do they call witch hair or something? They're they're made out. We we, we made. There's just a snell tied six odd hook. Okay. That that you know you can see. Uh, this one's old, but you can see this was a little newer. Um, we have we made them in, in in yellow too, yellow and white, and yellow, white, and orange. So you, you tied those up yourself? Snell tied them. A little fingernail polish around the snell. Okay. And this was something that we developed over years, and, and I'm telling you, the you go with a little bigger hook, you think, oh, you, you catch fish, uh -huh. you catch fish with almost anything, but you go, you don't catch as many. Uh -huh. This was just a dynamite setup, and cool. I had mothballed all these when they closed the R RCA, because uh -huh. that's where we started fishing, and then we went into near shore. So I've got all these Ganyans mothballed that we had made. My wife may help me make them. Cool. And. Uh, I, we've resurrected them. Now that we can fish out to 240, and potentially there's a, uh, a proposal with uh, with PFMC that we can, uh, the council, that we can fish, they're gonna bow the RCA line out, and particularly up above, uh, above San Simeon and Cambria area a little bit, and above the lighthouse a little bit, which is super good fishing. Okay. And then one spot that you have to keep your eye on is Pack Valley. You know where that is? Yeah, Pacific Valley? 
Yeah, you know what that is? yeah, way up there. Well, so Jeff, you got the big rock, the big uh, rock at uh, uh, Willow Creek. Okay. And then you got Sand Dollar. Yeah. Okay, and then you got the dip. Well, they're bowing that way out, and when we when we participated in the uh, RCA Rock Hod project, which was I think the last last research that we did, so it was about three years ago, myself and Brad Lee, poor guy. We uh, we went up there. We had like uh, 19 days of work, of wow. charter work, where we took we took Steve Reinecke. I'm sure you know him. Yeah. And we took another couple of guys and an uh, observer, and we went up there. And I found an area up off of Pack Valley that was probably, and I'm not kidding you, there's no exaggeration, at least a half a mile or more long, and ever bit as much wide. And I went over this spot, and, and I looked at the meter, and about 50 feet up off the meter, there was a red band, and about, about 100 feet below the surface. Huh. And we were in like 300 feet of water, 320 maybe feet of water. And we didn't know what it was. And what it turned out to be was a spawning mass of vermilion. No kidding. And every one was almost like a bookend. There, almost, I mean, there probably wasn't, you know, a few ounces between the... You know, there wasn't, there wasn't giant, they were, they were all a certain size. Huh. And uh, we caught those things. Every time we go down, all the way up the game, nothing else. Wow. Solid. And this went on and on and on until Reinecke told me, he says, you got to get out of here, Rocky. <laughs> this, this isn't about, this is, we, this is about, reason. and we just kept them busy. Every fish yeah. had to go into a bucket. Yeah. Because that's how they counted them and they measured them. Right. They had like 15 buckets. Yeah. And I had two reels on at the time. And I was just yo-yoing them. And I got them so busy, they didn't know what. Before I knew it, the hatch was full. <laughs> so, wow. good, good, good deal. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, keep that, that was, I'm sure it's still there. Yeah. It, it, it was just, I'd never seen anything quite like that, quite that large. And they, they were big fish too? Oh, they were like, uh, anywhere from five to seven pounds. Nice fish. Nice, nice fish. Yeah, 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 yeah quality really fish. Like Cool. And are you baiting those ganyans? Or you we just, do. We put a little, little bit. Of, we either use a little bit of salted anchovy on them, but the, the preferable uh, bait is squid. Squid. You know, squid is probably you know thirty-seven dollars a box wholesale to us. Whoa. For a twenty-two pound box. Wow. Thirty-seven. Bucks. Why has it gone up so much? Just the demand. I don't know oh. why, but it, it uh, that the squid thing is used to be. They used to get 500 a ton, and Dave's telling me now they're getting 12, 13, 14, 1500 a ton. Wow. So it's just, just out of, blown out of. So we don't use squid a lot, because I get anchovies. I go up there yeah. at Monterey and I, get, I bring them back in my truck with a pallet load. Yeah, yeah. And so we don't we don't typically use them as much, but but uh, but but they love squid. Yeah. And squid hangs on the bay a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But uh, huh. yeah, these fish caught two. I got a whole chest of vermilion in there. Yeah. Yeah, these fish were. Uh, and 200, 200 feet of water, 180 feet of water. They got a couple of Boccaccio in there too. Yeah, huh? this is just the miscellaneous thing. I I, I, la I layered the 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 uh, vermilions. Okay. Uh, in here, okay. up on layers. This is a whole box of just straight vermilions. Okay. And this is the other stuff that's still really good. Yeah. Um, they hold a little longer, so I'm gonna cut these up first for friends and family. And cool. then I'm going to three or four days. I'll work on these. <laughs> nice. And uh, you know, it's uh, in these times of weirdness. Pretty yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. All right, last boat over here that we'll show, and we'll head down to the Embarcadero. So it's old salmon trolling boat here. Old wooden boat. These are the are set up here to pull uh, crab pots, possibly, or even long lines with that hydraulic system there. But as you can see, this, this is an older boat, and he's set up to fish salmon. Got the salmon permit there, as you can see on the side. Got the two lead balls there hanging there. Uh, we always have a, a lighter one and the heavier one. The heavier one kind of drops straight down under the boat. Whereas the lighter one drags a little further behind the boat, and that just helps separate your gear. Uh, we can see over on that side of the boat, he has three set up. So if he's fishing three lines on either side, that's six lines total. And let's say you're fishing in 200 feet of water, you have a lure or bait spaced about every, oh, 12 feet apart. You're talking a, a boat like this could be fishing anywhere from 
40 to, to 60 lines um, as they're trolling through the water. So you can definitely cover a lot of water with that method of fishing. All right, doing a quick stop over here at the Morro Bay Maritime Museum. This has just started up in the last few years and they're starting to get a collection of, of different types of, of submarines and ships and boats and things like that. Uh, this is a pretty cool submarine. This is actually a rescue submarine. So essentially this submarine would go down and actually attach with that contraption right there to another submarine. So if a submarine was damaged, was unable to get back to the surface, they would send out this rescue submarine uh, to go down and, and pull the people out. Uh, pretty cool that they were able to get this deep submergence rescue vehicle. All right, we walk over here, we see some old tugboats, some old Coast Guard boats. This is an old tugboat that's operated out of Morro Bay for years. This is by the Anton Sylvester Tug Service. These tugboats were in operation off the coast here for the oil ships that used to come in, both out of Port San Luis. They used to come in to the Cal Poly Pier. They used to be the Union Oil Pier. And they used to come in off the coast here of Morro Bay because they used to provide fuel for the Morro Bay Power Plant. The Moore Bay Power Plant used to operate in what was called bunker fuel, which is this really viscous, uh, oily type of diesel fuel. And these large ships used to come in off the coast of the, of the high school, basically, and offload this bunker fuel, which the Moore Bay Power Plant would operate on. But when they switched over to natural gas, they no longer needed the, the, the fuel, the docking out there. And so then they moved their operations down to Port San Luis until they, they closed down the, the Union Oil Pier back in the late 1990s. So some other boats they have over here. There's an old Coast Guard boat. We'll go look at some other Coast Guard boats here in a little bit. There's an old boat there. I'm not sure what that one's about. All right, over here I see some uh, relics of the history of whaling along the central coast. This is an old, old school harpoon gun. This was used to, to shoot whales. And over here, this is a, a large vat for boiling down the whale blubber. So literally you would fill up this vat with the whale blubber and cook it down. And you'd have, it, have a fire burning underneath there, or some type of flame burning underneath there to reduce your, your whale blubber into a usable fat. I almost forgot about the homemade submarine. <laughs> this is this is crazy. I remember this when I was a kid. Uh, this guy in, in Port San Luis, he actually lived in in, in uh, Rio Grande in the late 70s. He built this homemade submarine and uh, he was taking it out. He was actually hoping to do do tourist trips with it. He was hoping to take people out on this this homemade submarine and uh, and make money off of it but it didn't work it out very well for him and uh, a couple years ago he donated this to the maritime museum uh, i'm not sure if i would get in that thing <laughs> i don't know that looks pretty pretty sketchy at least they have some some windows to look out of a couple windows to look out of there Hey, it even got a window in the front. My guess is that they would move these around to, to go up or down in the water column. All right, one of the types of fishing that we talked about earlier was persane fishing for the squid. So you're probably wondering, how do you offload many tons of squid off of your boat when they're quite small and they'd be difficult to remove in any other way than having a large vacuum? 
And that's what this contraption is here. This Ryko machine, it has a long tube and they would drop that tube down into the hole of the boat and they would literally suck out the squid, sends it through this machine here. And essentially what this machine does is it, it sucks the squid and then removes all the water. And then on the opposite side here, you would have a tote. This tote would be full of ice and the squid would be offloading into this tote of ice. All right, here we are at the Morro Bay Fish Company. This was actually bought out a few years ago by Santa Monica Seafoods. Santa Monica Seafoods is a, is a big company down in Southern California. And so basically what happens is the boat will pull up to the dock here. They would tie up to these, to these pilings along the side of the pier. And then they've got this crane here they would use. There would be a large basket that they would drop over the side. The fishers would, would fill them up. So here's the baskets right here. So a couple different sizes. So depending on how much they catch. So you would hook the crane on to this part right here, drop it over the side, fill it up, swing it back over here. Uh, this is the scale. So that would be the scale there. And there's a, a reader over there. So very accurate scale. Every fish that's brought in has to be weighed. They have a little portable conveyor belt here where you can, we can throw your catch on there and it's gonna move it off. And a lot of these uh, different types of fisheries have sorting going on. So a lot of the, the rockfish or the, the groundfish fisheries are multi-species. So when they go out, they're catching multiple species of fish on a given trip. And so they're gonna come back in and sort those by species. Uh, other fisheries actually like you to have different size classes. So in particular, like the sable fish, they have different size classes. They have small, medium, large size classes, and they get different dollars per pound for each of those size classes. And so they would be sorting those out also. Moving over here, we can see some large tanks. Now, normally these would be full of water and these are recirculating saltwater tanks. So fresh salt water is always circling back up into these tanks. And these are for the, the live fish, the live rockfish, ling cod. You could have cabazon in here and uh oh, a couple fish in there oh those are your fish yeah i'm gonna fly them right now all right cool so we've got three different species here all right let's start with this one here let's see if anybody can identify that one we've got another one over here and these two are both the same oh Ooh, we've got you, this one here it's I, a starry I, that's a starry rockfish canary Canary rockfish. Two vermils. And two vermilion rockfish. Uh, so these are oftentimes just lumped together as red snapper. Oh, please, if you ever see somebody calling something a red snapper, don't buy into it. Please correct them and ask, ask them, what type of rockfish do we have? Because they are not red snapper. We don't have red snapper along our coast. And if you ever hear somebody calling it that, it's most likely rockfish. We have lots of species of rockfish and somebody really even sh shouldn't uh, call it red rockfish. They should tell you what specific type of rockfish that it is. All right, so maybe we'll get a, a demo. You mind doing a, a, a fish clean demo for us? Sure. All right. So he's gonna, he's gonna pull out one of these, these fish here. We'll see if I can remember how. <laughs> All right. Uh, this, this one's a, this is the canary. That's the canary. So this one was at one point in time, a part of prohibited catch. Yeah. And uh, this year, are you able to keep two, I think? Is that uh, what it I is? Don't, I don't really know. Yeah, I know they, for sport at least, I know you're allowed to keep two of these, I believe. There you go. Excellent, excellent work. All right. And when you want to take the bones out, this is what I do, cut the ribs. Nice. Like feel here like I missed one right there a little bone. and now that's a boneless fillet yeah excellent you've done that a few times yeah <laughs> now the starry rockfish is a little bit rare that's that's one of the few stars I've ever seen oh. well you got to be on the bottom to get those yeah they and they they are a beautiful rockfish yeah 
see why they call him a starry rockfish with all those white spots there. He's filled with eggs, probably, or okay. jelly. Well, got a little bit of eggs. Oh, he does. So yeah, that white mass there, or that yellow mass, is the eggs. You make quick work of that. Nice job. Nice. Moochin' or trolling? Moochin'. Moochin'. Yeah, trolling is boring. It is very boring. We Folks generally don't do that around here. I've always wondered if it would work. What, the trolling? No, oh, mooching, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Why? I, the fish gotta be up. The fish gotta be up to get a moochin'. High in the water you, column? Well, yeah, because the, the, you're only using a small banana weight. At least we did up there. You can't go very deep. Uh huh. Yeah. Tough to go deep. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, I've wanted to try it up here. I've just, just never committed the time to it. Oh. What's your favorite rockfish to eat? Ah, uh, they're all good. I don't, I don't know. They're usually the small ones. We always used to do the, the fishing in Monterey. There'd always be extra fish on the, the small ones. You know, we used to walk them up to the restaurants. And, yeah, yeah. You know, down on the dock. And, uh, they you know come back half an hour later they'd be in a big coke flat filled with french fries and tartar sauce nice there's always a small fish okay you know whatever is left over i don't really have a here. yeah i can never really tell a difference in flavor but i know, know some folks think there's a difference in flavor uh, on them yeah. Jeez, cook a platter and never know the difference yeah uh, I, I, I just make fish tacos with them anyway. All right, here we have the ice plant. So this is a very, very, very important part of the infrastructure for Morro Bay commercial fisheries is having an ice plant. Um, and basically the ice is, is made in this, this building here. You basically uh, spray water onto a big drum and then there's uh, the drum basically spins around and something scrapes it off. So it makes this really, really high quality ice. Sounds kind of weird to say, but you couldn't use cube ice for what they're doing. And I, and I think there's a little piece of it over here. And so this ice makes really good for, for packing it around fish, right? It's really small, crumbly ice. And so when you have a, have a bunch of it packed around the fish, it just kind of forms and molds around the body of the fish and doesn't bruise it. So it's really important to have a good ice plant. So two ways you can get ice out of this machine is you could have have uh, this part of the machine open so the ice comes down through this tube right here. Maybe you want to fill up some tubs um, or you can run it all the way out to the end and then down through this hose. And then of course, if you had a boat, you would just drop this hose over the side of the, of the dock here, down into the hole of the boat, and then it would fill up the hole of the boat. So it's a really efficient way of filling up the ice really quickly. Uh, it's, it's very cheap. This is a, a government subsidized facility here. And how, how much you sell them like 500 pounds of ice for nowadays? What does that go for? Five cents a pound. Five cents a pound. Yeah, so if you're ever uh, throwing a big it's party, cheap. it's, yeah. It's really cheap. I, I went to Half Moon Bay three years ago and the same like a 600 pound tote was 30 bucks here. It cost me three years ago almost $40. Wow. And half moon wow. And they got brand new compressors. This is all brand new. Yeah, brand new they're machine. Even a, yeah, they're a year old now, almost. Fantastic. And they want to keep the price affordable in Mall Bay and say keep the price at five cents. Yeah. Five cents a pound. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah, so next time you guys are throwing a big kegger or something like that and need a bunch of ice, this is the place to come to get ice really cheap. And you could do that. I come down here sometimes, so I'm gonna go tuna fishing and I need 100 pounds of ice or something like that. Um, I'll bring my own coolers there down here and get cool and get ice just for myself. Here's the finished product. All right, nice, good eating. <laughs> oh, probably my favorite restaurant here in Morro Bay is, is Tognanzini's Dockside 2 restaurant. You see they have delicious barbecue oysters for two dollars a piece so mark is a is a commercial fisherman he still is a commercial fisherman and he goes out 
when the fishing's good for things like albacore or salmon and he will we will he will bring those back to sell but when he's not out commercial fishing he is here running his restaurants oh and he's got some uh, some crab in here these look like rock crab these look like red rock crab as i mentioned you can sex a crab very easily i will attempt to reach down here and pull out a crab to sex for you folks so you can see how this is done so the red rock crab live mostly along the rocky areas but you can also find them in uh in places that are sandy bottom when i'm out going for dungeness crab on occasion i will get the get the rock crabs come here baby and these things have big pinchers so you you definitely want to be careful with them uh, as you can see on the abdomen here we have a narrow abdomen which indicates that it's a male so you're only allowed to keep the male crabs let's see if you'll bite the camera yeah not gonna do it but you would not want to get your finger in there that would hurt quite badly all right all right normally we do a field trip here at Toganzini's and, and Mark comes out and talks to us about commercial fishing uh, but unfortunately they've had to really shutter big parts of the restaurant here uh, you can still eat out but you have to practice social distancing you see what they've done here inside to make sure that people stay apart from each other got the seafood laid out So if you ever get a chance, I encourage you to come down here to Tognanzini's. He does a great job of buying seafood from local commercial fishers and really supporting the local economy. And, and he's a family run local business. So coming here to eat certainly encourages that keeping it local. All right, we're gonna head out onto the pier here. A couple different uh, boats are out here. On the right side here, we'll see the Morro Bay Harbor Patrol. So the Morro Bay Harbor Patrol is involved in the harbor primarily. They will go out and rescue boats from about Point Estero down to Point Bouchon if something happens. But generally, they're just they're just here in the harbor, and they're involved in in the safety of the harbor, uh, protecting folks that are out fishing or kayaking or paddleboarding somebody gets stuck in the mud they actually come will come rescue you um, this boat behind us here is the coast guard boat so the coast guard boat is the 47 foot lifeboat these are amazing boats and the fact that they are self-riding what that means is that this boat is out in big waves and it gets flipped over it will flip right back upright uh, so the Coast Guard is not involved in, in fisheries at all. Coast Guard is involved in protecting the coast. So the Coast Guard is out there to protect our coastline. They are involved in pre uh, preventing smugglers from coming in. That may sound kind of silly, but a few years ago when there was these pangas that were running up and down the coast, bringing up marijuana and other drug paraphernalia from Mexico, the Coast Guard was directly involved in that. And there's actually a Coast Guard cadet that was killed off the Channel Islands when a panga boat rammed the Coast Guard boat and, and killed one of their sailors, unfortunately. But they are, they are not involved in any kind of uh, fisheries management or fisheries enforcement. Uh, they're never gonna come and, and check your catch or try and, and get on your boat and look at what you've been catching. They will get on your boat and make sure you have all the safety equipment involved. Um, a few years ago, I was fishing up off of Cayucas and in my dad's boat and something happened where the motor died and we were unable to get it started. And we, we called up the Coast Guard and said, hey, we're, we're up off of Cayucas. We have a dead boat. We can't get it started. 
and will you come and tow us in? And they did. They were, they were, they were happy to do it. It took about an hour for them to get up there and, and hook up a tow line and tow the boat in. But they did ask us about 10 times if we ran out of gas. If your boat does honestly break down, they will not charge you. But if you're if you run out of gas or you, something else silly happens to your boat and it was it was something that you could have avoided they actually will charge you for that now in southern california because there's so many people down there the coast guard will not tow you in and so there's something down there called vessel assist if you don't have a, a contract with vessel assist you have to pay the boat to come out and pick you up and tow you in and it will cost thousands of dollars for you to do that so a lot of folks just have the vessel assist insurance which costs several hundred dollars a year but that is just insures if you're down in southern california that if you break down that they'll tow you in and they won't charge you many thousands of dollars unfortunately another boat uh, that i usually talk about isn't here right now and that's the California Department of Fish and Wildlife boat. Normally it's moored right there. It's called the Bluefin. The Bluefin is about a 60 foot vessel and it's owned by the state of California and it's part of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife enforcement program. And so this boat is operated by wardens. So these are fish, what we call fish and game wardens. Now they're called fish and wildlife wardens, but the wardens are active peace officers and what that means is that they they are like police they go through police officer training and they carry a firearm so when you see these folks out there you'll see that they they have a firearm and they have handcuffs and all those types of things uh ironically and don't ask me how i know this but they can actually give you a traffic ticket ah i got a traffic ticket up in oregon one time uh, by a fish and game warden up there i had i had no idea i wasn't real i was only going 10, 10 miles out of the speed limit but the guy pulled me over and i was like really he's like yep i'm a peace officer i can give traffic tickets so fyi be careful if you ever see a fishing game warden because they can give out tickets as easily as a, a police officer could so we'll talk a little bit about how fisheries are monitored and how they're policed so as far as the policing goes it's done by the california california department of fish and wildlife so once again they have fish cops aka wardens and these are the peace officers that enforce the fishing regulations and so these folks have a boat the bluefin uh, they also have a small little zodiac boat that's attached on there that they will launch and that allows them to go up to each individual boat and be able to check their catch and if you're not following the the rules and regulations that are laid forth either avoiding marine protected areas or if you have the wrong species or the wrong size you will get a fishing game violation and let me tell you this is not something that you want to get a few years ago i was out fishing for white sea bass and unfortunately i had a short white sea bass they have to be 28 inches long um, i had a bad tape measure on my boat actually it was stupid on me i had a tape measure on my boat that started at zero inches all the way up to i think it was 36 inches but the the number two was the first number that was noted on there and i cut it off on that line and so basically every single fish that i measured was two inches shorter than it actually was the warden came up and i knew knew the warden his name was jared and he said steve you got a short sea bass here and i'm like what there's no way i got a short sea bass i measured that thing a bunch of times i i thought it was 29 and a half inches that's what i measured it at and uh, he measured it and showed me and sure enough it was 27 and a half inches a half an inch short and i said i don't know how, how that happened jared I, you know i'm not trying to poach out here he's like i know you're not but you know short is short uh it was a short fish and the guy on my boat looks over at my tape measure and he sees that that it, it starts at two and he's like he's like hey hoser your tape measure starts at two I'm like, no way. I could not believe it. Um, and I said, Jared, come on. That's got to be one of the stupidest things you've ever seen. And he's like, he's like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty dumb. But you know what, Steve? Pregnant's pregnant, isn't it? Not much you could say to that. I guess he was right. Short is short. If you have a short fish, it's a short fish, no matter what the excuse is. Uh, so that, that was a good learning experience for me to make sure that everything is, uh, is according to the right sizes and to make sure that you're you're not even close on your measurement. You should not even be close on that. And so the fine for that, it was a infraction. If, if you have intent for a fishing game violation, they could actually charge you with a misdemeanor, but this was just termed an infraction. And it was $1,500 for that one fish, 
fortunately it was the only violation that i'd had <coughs> in california and uh and i was able to get it reduced i went and saw the judge and just basically pleaded stupidity and he reduced the fine to 450 dollars but it's a great learning experience for me and uh, definitely something that i hope to never repeat again in the future but fishing game violations are very very serious uh, because it's difficult to patrol the ocean they can't be everywhere at any one point in time they make the fines very very severe as a deterrent for folks to to be breaking fishing game violations for example um, abalone are, are quite valuable we learned about how abalone could be you know 100 plus dollars a pound so there's a, there's a big black market for those and so back when people used to poach quite a few abalone, they eventually raised the fines up to $10,000 for one abalone. Uh, very, very strict fines for those. So other ways that these fisheries are regulated is that these, these wardens will, will check the catch when these commercial fishers come back to shore and they will be there as they're offloading. You have to make sure that they're bringing in, once again, the right species, the right size during the right season. And they have the authority to, to check these at any point in time. So fish and game laws or fish and wildlife laws are, are different than what we would think of laws in the United States. We, in the United States, we always assume that you are innocent until proven guilty. Like if a police officer wants to check your house or check your car for something, they have to have a warrant, right? You have to have probable cause. Well, with fish and wildlife laws or fish and game laws, there, there really is no probable cause other than they, they think you may be violating a fish and game rule. And so they can check your car, they can check your boat, they can do virtually whatever they want uh, until you prove yourself innocent. So it's kind of the opposite. And you're, you're sort of guilty until proven innocent with a lot of these fish and wildlife laws. The other type of monitoring and enforcement that's done is done by the, the NOAA Fisheries Group. So NOAA is National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And so NOAA Fisheries is involved in helping to set the rules and regulations for harvesting of seafood. And they're also gonna be involved with folks that may be on your boat checking your catch. And so we call these folks observers. And so observers are folks that are physically on your boat so they are there on your boat, physically watching what is being brought in. And with certain types of fisheries, like folks that fish for, for trawling, uh, folks that are out trawling, catching bottom fish, demersal types of fish, like rockfish and lean cod and things like that. Uh, these folks have 100% observer covers. That means every single trip that that boat goes out on, they have an observer on board that's recording what is being brought in. Other types of fishing, they may only have an observer on board every, every third trip or so. Like a lot of the long line trips, they might only have an observer every third trip. And it really depends on the type of fishery and the possible impacts from bycatch that that fishery may have. So these observers, it's interesting, uh, these observers on the boat, they have to be paid for by the captain. So this isn't something that's paid for by the government, but the captain actually has to pay for that. So it adds to the overhead of different types of fisheries if they have to have the physical observers on board. As you can imagine, the observers really aren't wanted. Now, you know, most of these captains are pretty nice, but really you're sort of like the enemy out there. You're, you're trying to sort of catch them doing something bad. And there are a lot of different rules and regulations involved. And, and you know, people may unintentionally at times break a rule or regulation and these observers are there, you know, they're gonna catch you doing it. So unfortunately, it's not the, really one of the best jobs in the world, just cause you're sort of looked at like the enemy, they're like you're like the snitch out there that's trying to catch them doing something bad. Um, so to kind of try and get around that, they've come up with a different system to be able to monitor catch. And this is called the, the VMS system. That just stands for a vessel monitoring system. So the VMS is a system of cameras and it's a system of including a GPS device on the boat. So what they can do is they can have these VS, uh, VMS systems on the boat. It's cameras that are recording what's going on. It has a GPS device that's indicating the location. And then they're able to, to determine where exactly those people are located. And then by reviewing the video, once they return to port, they can look at the bycatch that they have and see if the boat is possibly throwing fish over the side of the boat that they shouldn't be. Uh, so they are trying to move towards the VMS system a little bit more and it's just the fact that it'd be, it's much easier for the captains to have this camera and this GPS on the boat as opposed to having 
a, a, per, a live person on the boat. Because, um, you know, maybe you, know, you have to feed that person. Maybe they get sick, seasick, and you got to take care of them. Um, who knows what's going to happen with some of those scenarios. But at the same time, the captains have to pay for this VMS system. So they have to pay for the cameras, the GPS. They have to pay for the upkeep of this system. And so once again, it's another cost associated with that fishery uh, that they, they'd much rather not have. But with many of these fisheries, they, they have to have those, those types of requirements for them. All right, so a couple boats that we see over here. These are the charter fishing boats. So the Starfire. Uh, this other boat it might be the princess over there so these are our sport fishing boats or charter boats these are the boats that take anglers out to go rock fishing primarily um, really around here there isn't a lot of salmon fishing that's done on these boats because our, our salmon fishing generally isn't isn't quite that good uh, and they can put on that big boat there they could put literally 40 or 50 people to go rock fishing um, and you can make quite a bit of money doing that. They're charging anywhere from, depending upon how long they're going out for, but anywhere from 60 to maybe $120 per person to go on those boats. All right, this boat here is the Ocean Rose. When I was talking about the aquaculture facility up at Cayucas, the abalone farm, the Ocean Rose is the kelp harvester. So the Ocean Rose has a way to go along and basically trim off the kelp down about two feet below the surface. They basically slide this whole contraption out in front of the boat, and drop it down over the front. Uh, it basically cuts off the kelp and then that conveyor belt will move the kelp up. So this whole, whole system basically is you know, shifted down into the water. And then it cuts the kelp, brings it up on that conveyor belt, and then it dumps it into that whole part of the hole there. And then they bring it up onto the dock. And they've got a crane here where they, they load the kelp up into these large bags. They use the crane here to, to lift up the bags of kelp and then drop it into a boat. All right, let's see what else we got here. On this other side, we've got a couple large working boats. These are large tugboats that are involved with doing commercial work. Uh, they could be helping to rebuild docks, things like that. Oh yeah, look at this. We got a, a large, this Lady Irene here. This is a large crab boat. Wow, look at all the pots on that boat oh my gosh that's pretty crazy that's a lot of pots on that boat oh my goodness so each of those pots weighs oh, close to 100 pounds maybe 125 pounds so you can imagine all the weight that this uh, this boat has on its deck right now so as we talked about uh, crab fishing is a very sustainable type of a fishery using these pots out of the ocean the crabs crawl in through the side uh, you're only able to keep the the male crabs you gotta let all the female crabs go you're only allowed to keep crab that are more than six inches across the back so any any small crab or any female crab you can very easily let back go so make, makes it a very sustainable type of a fishery anytime you can release the bycatch that makes it very sustainable but as i also mentioned if they had each one of these pots set as a different buoy, I mean, how many pots are there? It's one, two, three, four, five, six deep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight across. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a lot of crab pots on that boat. And so you can imagine if every single one of those pots has a buoy going towards the surface, that that's a lot of buoys that are are hanging out in the ocean. And as these whales are migrating or feeding up and down the coast, uh, there's just an increased chance of them running into one of those buoys and getting entangled. So marine mammal entanglement is a, is a big concern with any kind of pot fishery. Uh, also, we talked about the ghost pots. So once again, if you lose one of those and it's gonna keep fishing, uh, that could be uh, you know, basically a basket of death for a certain period of time until that pot rusts out. Now there are safety features on those pots to be able to keep them from uh, 
continue to kill organisms. They'll have areas on there with, with string that rots out over time that if there was something trapped in there and that string rots out, then the whole trap basically opens up. All right, another boat here. This appears to be, hmm, let's see. Got a spool on there. I don't see any doors. I think that's a gill netter. I'm gonna go with a with an offshore gill netter. So basically, what that boat is doing, that that large spool on the back there that has a, a large gill net on there, and so what they're gonna do is they're gonna they're gonna play that out behind the boat. They're gonna let that sit in the water overnight, generally. And then in the morning, they're gonna come back in and wind that up. So this big contraption off of the back there, that would prevent the gill net from getting under the boat and possibly getting caught up in the screws or caught up in the props. Right? You can imagine how bad that would be if you uh, went back over your net and got the net all caught up in your, in your gear down underneath the boat. Uh, these boats are so big, you'd have to literally dive, go diving down under the water to remove that gear. So that, that ensures that the gear won't get caught up in the boat. All right, another, another commercial fisher coming in there. Not sure what that guy's fishing for. Difficult to tell by looking at his boat. Couple more uh, charter boats over there. Several other boats along the side there. A lot of these guys, it looks like, are fishing for crab. They're long lining. Let's see this boat, this TKO boat right here. That's definitely a long line boat. So this boat's going to be going out and long lining for for demersal fish, things like sablefish, rockfish, lingcod, cabazon, things like that. The boat next to him, probably the same thing. But a lot of these boats will diversify. Uh, if they have the gear hydraulic systems on their boat, they could shift over to crabbing and other, other types of fishing. All right, another boat here. This is the Migrator. A lot of these boats just have really big bright lights on them just to make sure that that you can see them when you're out on the ocean. A lot of these guys spend the night out on the ocean. Big, tall outrigger poles. Once again, when they're when they're trolling for salmon or something like that, they're gonna lay those outrigger poles out. And you can see that he does have some salmon gear on the boat. So this boat maybe is converting over from fishing for crab to fishing for salmon. All right, that's about all I got for you guys today. Just wanted to give one last parting shot of these adorable California sea otters rafting up here in the eelgrass. Uh, we actually can see a couple a couple pups there. I think I see two pups, uh, one on the kind of the inside and one over there on the outside of the eelgrass. So there are some adorable little pups down here. And of course, if you've been in my class before, you know that these are the rapers and pillagers of the ocean. Uh, they sure look cute, don't they? But dang it, we know they're out there raping those baby harbor seals when they get a chance. All right, we'll catch you guys next time.